Hello, good morning. Good morning. Such a beautiful day. Buongiorno. It feels like primavera outside. Oh, great. Great. So briefly, I have been receiving since Thursday night links to your assignments. The first written assignment was due tonight, and you still have time for that. You still have time to request my assistance if you need it. I just want to tell you that up until Saturday morning or so, every time I receive a link to your Google Docs file with the assignment, I responded right away, thanking you, confirming that I have received it. During the weekend, of course, I was busy doing other things. For example, helping my son move into the city, because of course, wouldn't you love it to spend half of your salary for a large studio 40 minutes from Manhattan. I suggested that he could lease a Maserati for the same amount of money. But what do Italian fathers know about life? So that was. Today, I'm going to first provide a historical introduction to Machiavelli's times. Because as, as I've said many times, we are not going to delve into the minute historical details. This is not a history or historiography class. So I, I don't want you to remember the names of the battles, the names of every king, prince, and duke. You're not going to be tested on that kind of knowledge. However, it is necessary to place Machiavelli's examples and historical references into a correct view of the historical events. And, and so we will talk about the big picture, the big players, the various political structures and organizations, okay? And that hopefully will be much easier to remember. And then of course you can always refer to the notes in the textbook, or just go on the internet if you want to know more, if you're curious, and you'll find plenty of places from Wikipedia to more academic, more professional websites where you can explore the history of the time. Then, as planned, we are going to talk about chapters three to five, and mostly we have this monster of a chapter, which is chapter three, and I will try to focus on a few sections and unpack the system that Machiavelli deploys in there. And again, as you will see, we will, for the most part in here, skip the historical examples. Okay. We'll see if I'll be able to get to chapter five or not. Chapter three would be enough for me because chapters four and five are not as important in this group of chapters. On Wednesday, as planned, we will deal with the 48 laws of power and I assigned readings, excerpts. I did that at, at a late time. I should have done it earlier. If you are not able to read those excerpts before Wednesday, that's fine, and uh, take advantage of my introduction and do the reading at a later time. On Friday, I will introduce and we will watch scenes from another quote-unquote Machiavellian movie, and it'll be The Godfather, part one, okay? So, you know that you have maps in the book, right? Uh, I think it's pages 33, 34, and 35, you have various maps, but why not? I, I put my own map on the board, and I'll keep the text on the screen. Of course, I encourage you to bring the book, whether you have the actual book or the electronic version, to class, so that you, we can, at some point, not even have the text on the screen in here, and I can take advantage of the whole board for various analysis and 
schemas, okay? And some students have approached me telling me that they had ordered the book at the beginning of the semester, but they weren't receiving it. It's very simple. Uh, cancel your order and get the Kindle edition. It'll cost you $12.99 or something like that. Uh, so perhaps even a few dollars cheaper than the paper format and you'll be fine, okay? Don't wait. If you, at this point, after four weeks, you haven't received your book, cancel the order, right? They don't deliver. They cannot hold you hostage. If you've paid already, get your money back. It is possible, okay? So, I drew a map of Italy to talk about the political, social, and the larger strategic factors that affected the critical events that Machiavelli refers to. Because first and foremost, you have to understand that from the time Machiavelli really entered into the adult world, from the time he was 25, born in 1469, right? Or was it 67? I think it's a 69, but... 69. Okay, good. Thank you. From the time he was 25 and he started working, uh, after he uh, gave up on getting a degree in jurisprudence, his father was a lawyer, although he didn't practice that part, he spent apparently a lot of time just working as an intellectual, uh, if you can call that a, a work, uh, translating books from the classical era, entertaining intellectual exchanges with others, and leaving off the properties the family had. It was a family the Machiavelli's of, you can call it minor aristocratic uh, nobility, and of course, what happens with those families is that lacking any real kind of business, whatever money you can extract from your properties runs out or decreases generation after generation. So from that point of view, Machiavelli, when he was forced to retire to his properties, he didn't even make as much money as his father, okay? So Machiavelli started working around the age of 25, and that was when Italy entered into a crisis uh, that was prompted by the invasion of Italy by King Charles of France. And we're trying to understand why this happened, what were the critical factors in Italy what were the elements that caused so much political fraction, so much uh, friction between the different areas, the different cities, the different states, okay? Feel free to interact me, ask me to clarify or to expand. And again, we're trying to gather the big picture, the situation that applies to Machiavelli's time, really, from 1469 through 1527, the year of his death. And in fact, this situation continued more or less for another 30 years. It was only during the second half of the 1500s that the crisis ended and the conclusion was not a positive one for Italy. Basically, by the end of the 16th century, Italy was still fragmented, was still not a nation state. It was not a unified state in the modern sense. And various parts of Italy were either under the direct control of a foreign state or under the umbrella under the influence of a foreign state, which explains why Italy then became a unified state and an independent state even later than 
the much younger United States, only starting with 1861, so much that the literature and the press from the time in Italy constantly referred to the United States as their brother, as another modern country that only in modern times had gained its independence. Okay. So here you have the Italian peninsula, right? You have to the west the Tyrrhenian Sea with the major islands, Corsica and Sardinia. At this point, both islands are still Italian, right? Corsica will be purchased by France only around the time of Napoleon Bonaparte's birth. Napoleon was from Corsica. To the east, you have the Adriatic Sea, which is much narrower, right? In its narrowest point, less than 100 miles separate the shores of Italy and the shores of what used to be Yugoslavia, and now is Montenegro, Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, etc. To the south, you have the Ionian Sea, in between Apulia and Calabria, and of course, you also have Sicily to the south. Now, keep in mind also, and you can refer to the book again, go to page 33 or so, and you have a visual if you need one now, but otherwise, picture Italy within the context of the Mediterranean. Well, first of all, think of what was the significance of the Mediterranean before the age of explorations was completed, right? Because Christopher Columbus reached Central America and the Caribbeans only in 1492, right? But it would take another 50 to 100 years for those explorations to be multiplied and extended to other areas of the world. And also for the consequences of those discoveries to have a more dramatic impact on the politics and on the economic equilibrium, the economic markets of the time. But during Machiavelli's time, the Mediterranean was one of the most strategic areas. Because the Mediterranean were, was the place where goods coming from Africa and from Asia were transported and imported into Europe. The centrality of Italy within the Mediterranean, the fact that Italy sticks its peninsula going south and being as close as 100 miles to northern Africa. And at that time, the exchanges with northern Africa were very uh, developed. The fact that Italy practically blocked or was able to block traffic between the western part and the eastern part of the Mediterranean made Italy key to the control of an area that in turn established or, or set the foundation for the European economies of the time. The European economies of Central and Northern Europe relied to a great extent on the products that were coming from Africa and from Asia. And those products, the raw materials, were then manufactured and turned into the manufacturing of finished products in various places from Italy to France to Holland, Germany, etc. So Italy controlled a very important, a very relevant, a very strategic area such as the Mediterranean. And because of the proximity to both Northern Africa and the Middle East, Italy took the lead in the importing of those products from Africa and from the Middle East. And the limited amount of export that was allowed by 
the economic exchanges of the time, but mostly it was importing that the, Italian, that the Italians did. And that's how you find so much art in Italy that was created during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. The reason why, if you look at those kind of bogus uh, uh, classifications and rankings from UNESCO, let's say 60%, 70% of the art in the world can be found in Italy, it, it doesn't matter what the number is, and I don't know how you measure the percentage and what is art, but the reason why you find so much art in Italy is quite simply not just the creativity of the Italian race, it is quite simply the amount of money that was going around during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And part of that wealth went into the construction of churches, palaces, paying for artists, for the best artists of the period. Most of them Italian, but many of them also came to Italy from other European countries to create those works of art that you find in Italian museums. Not to mention the fact that of course you go to Paris and you find a lot of uh, Italian art, or to Vienna you find a lot of Italian art, because through the centuries the various invaders, not just those who purchased the art, but a lot of invaders took art from Italy and uh, brought it back to their countries, okay? So let's review the uh, international partners and then we'll get into Italy. So just when Machiavelli was born, less than 30 years had passed since the Turks conquered Constantinople. Constantinople uh, uh, fell in the 1450s, 1452 or something like that, and entered into Greece and started advancing north on the shores of the Adriatic Sea, or at least started applying pressure, military pressure, going from Greece, for example, into Albania, which would be more or less here. So this meant that the previous strong ally of Italian states and European states, which was the remnants, what remained of the Eastern Roman Empire, the survival of the original Roman Empire, was replaced by a government that was indirectly or directly hostile to the Italian states and represented a threat both for the Italian states to the east and for the Austrian Empire to the north. And in fact, for the next 200 years, you, you, you have plenty of military clashes between these uh, various players. As I alluded, I ran out of space up here. We have the Turks in here. We'll skip this for a moment because this is Italian territory at this point. So we'll review that later. North, you have Austria. You have the empire, right? And I called it the Austrian empire. You can call it the German empire, but it's basically the empire, which includes territories of Austria, Hungary, Switzerland, southern Germany, and part of the Czech Republic, parts of what is nowadays Poland, and also parts of Italy, in fact, east of and north of Milan, in the area that is now Alto Adige, Trentino Alto Adige, you find at this point from the 1480s, you find an established presence of the German Empire that has occupied those territories. In fact, if you go to Bolzano in Italy to this day, the primary language in that local community is German and not Italian, okay? And they have a strong sentiment of allegiance 
to German-speaking countries to the point where, similarly to Scotland, they've tried to become independent or even join the Austrian state and separate from Italy. And Italy, the Italian government has recognized their special circumstances and that region enjoys a degree of autonomy greater than other regions, autonomy from the central government in Rome to this day. Okay, so clearly the German Empire is applying pressure both in what the, the, the West and to the South, right? To the South also because they would very much like to have a port, to have an entrance uh, into the Adriatic Sea, which at this point is controlled for the most part, especially from here on, by the Republic of Venice. It's all Venetian on this side, on that side as well. So to the north, Switzerland, we said, is still partly independent and partly German. So part city-states and part independent. To the west, we have France. And France is one of the more modern nation states. Even though their, their process of national unification has been going on at this point for more than 200 years, from the 1200s into the 1400s. France is a more modern kind of state, unified with a central administration, with a repre strong representation of the central government in the various regions, with a national army, with a national taxation system. So an organized system of extraction of resources from society and application of those resources both to the internal administration of the state and also to the expansion of the state. Because the national state is made for growth, internal growth and external expansion, right? That, that's the idea of that political model during this period. The same can be said for the other states. If you move in that direction, of course, past France, you find England, and England is also a national state. Although during this period, during Machiavelli's period, England is not very powerful because it's not as strong an economy as France or even some of the Italian states, right? If you take the state of Venice, probably the state of Venice is at least as rich as England in terms of economic resources and wealth. To further south, you find, of course, Spain. And Spain, too, a bit late, has joined the game of nation states. So the process of unification in Spain is still ongoing during, not, not complete, during the time of Machiavelli, before the end of the 15th century, at the beginning of the 16th century. But they have that kind of organization that gives them more resources, and in fact, both France and Spain will come into Italy, will try to invade parts of Italy, France will try to get southern Italy, they will fail, they will retreat, Spain will get into southern Italy, they will stay eventually, they will also acquire a military presence in southern Tuscany so that they can they can control the whole Tyrrhenian Sea from Sicily to Tuscany, the whole triangle, you see, this whole area. France will end up exercising its influence over this area between Turin and Genoa and just the very northernmost part of the Tyrrhenian Sea. And the empire, by the end of these wars, by the end of the critical times that Machiavelli lived through, would remain a strong presence just in that area of Bolzano, of Alto Adige, that I mentioned before, and trying to push south towards Trent, little by little. And of course, they'll become, they'll remain a, a, a player enmeshed in Italian things to the point where eventually uh, they, they will control 
the Italian Northeast from Venice to Milan and past Milan until Italian unification, okay? In an area called Lombardo Veneto, during the 19th century, Milan was under Austria. Venice was under Austria after they lost their independence in 1796, in 1796, uh, uh, Tri Trieste was, was under Austria, etc., etc. Okay, those were the international players, and keep in mind the big picture, the very central strategic position of Italy. If you control Italy, you control the Mediterranean, because you have a series of strains <coughs> between Europe and Africa that are narrow enough that a small to medium-sized fleet can block commercial traffic. And also, if you control areas such as Apulia, then you can mount military expeditions directed at the Turks, because the Turks has established its presence in this area for less than 50 years, and therefore they're kind of weak in there. More importantly, from here, you can go to the Middle East, perhaps mount another crusade. By this time, crusades were a thing of the past. The latest crusade had been conducted less than 200 years, uh, almost 200 years earlier, but the idea was still there. And it was not just for religious reasons. We control the Holy Land, we control the holy places where Jesus was born and Jesus died. No. Controlling the Middle East, controlling the area that is now Palestine and Israel meant having the control of one of the areas where goods from the rest of Asia arrived into the Mediterranean. Because there were three places where those goods were sent by, by merchants from India, from Indonesia, from China. Lebanon. And in fact, you find that most crusades included control of Lebanon, which is, has no religious places, really, uh, Palestine and Egypt. But Egypt is quite more difficult to control, whereas the other two areas, Israel, Palestine, and Lebanon, are smaller. And therefore, you don't need a huge, you don't need to send a huge army to control uh, those places. And then you, you you still have those products coming in uh, and you, you control how you bring those goods from there into Italy and from Italy into the rest of Europe. So Italy, because of this strategic position, was a commercial economy that thrived, in fact, since after the year 1000 and up to Machiavelli's life for 500 years, Italy was a thriving mercantile economy, okay? Whereby Italian merchants would go to Northern Africa and the Middle East, purchase goods, bring them back into Italy, sell some of them in the Italian market, export a lot of them everywhere else in Eastern, Central, Western Europe. And that's how they made, they made so much money who are the Italian players? Let's look at the political situation of Italy during this time. So, let's see. We'll, we'll move from, from the south up. The largest state during this period is the Kingdom of Naples, which more or less had this kind of border. So, about 40% of the Italian territory the entire south parts of the set of central Italy and the island of Sicily, which is the largest of these three islands, were controlled by an Italian dynasty. And it was called, as I said, the kingdoms of Naples in Italy. It was also called Il Regno delle Due Sicilie, the kingdom of the two Sicilies. Although it was the largest Italian state, it was not the most powerful, because it was the least organized and the one that had not jumped, made the uh, jump from uh, a medieval state to a modern national state. And what held this kingdom back 
and what deprived the central government of essential resources for any kind of foreign politics or expansion was the survival of feudalism in this area. Feudalism is a very basic political organization, form of political and administrative organization. Basically, it's not unique to Europe or Italy. You find it in Japan, you find it in other parts of Asia, or even Africa. Whenever you don't have the resources to have representatives of the government everywhere in the territory controlled by government, you simply delegate on a personal basis and you say to someone, you will take charge in this area and I don't want to know anything. I want nothing to do with what you do. Just promise me that every year you'll give me a certain number of soldiers and a certain amount of money from taxes. Okay, those soldiers will uh, be used for defense or for aggressive military campaigns. And I cannot invest any resources in administrating that area for you. And whoever receives an area will be called a prince or a duke or a baron or a count or a viscount, right? Those titles that you're familiar with, the marquise. In turn, of course, even a, an entire region, such as Apulia or Sicily, would be too big for a single leader with limited resources, so they further subdivide that, right? So you go from a nation or part of a nation to a region, from the region to provinces, from provinces to single castles. So you have a pyramid where at the bottom you find the seigneur, the lord of a castle controlling a valley, controlling uh, a town built around the castle and the surrounding territory. So an area that is small enough that a single leader without administrative skills can control every single thing, right? They know what is going on, they can make decisions about justice, about the economy, they can protect the area from their castle. Right? That would be the lowest level of nobility and a group of castles within the same valley, within the same area, would be under another lord and a group of provinces would be under another lord. That's why you have this pyramid. And it's very much the personal uh, connection that makes the thing work. I put you there, you're my man and you put someone over other areas, smaller areas in your territory, they are your men. Does it remind you of anything? It's the same organization, the same structure that you find in the market, right? But it's also the same kind of cultural, social approach, the same cultural approach to social relationships that you still find in parts of Italy, southern Italy, but other parts of Italy. That is the, the fact that I know you, our relationship is stronger than the laws, than the rules, right? What is that someone in Italy will tell you? Oh, I needed to have x-rays, right? In Italy you have a public health system. They told me I had to wait for 12 months. But I know someone at the hospital because the head of the administration of the hospital is a cousin of my best friend and so I got an appointment for my x-ray for next week. So there are rules and there are personal connections. And personal connections become more important than the rules. And the people who entertain this kind of transactions whereby you get ahead of anyone else for your x-rays because you know someone, they feel perfectly comfortable because they place personal relationships above anyone else. I know you, you're part of my clan. And if I don't know you, I know someone else who's vouching for you. And therefore, you're like family, okay? Which also explains why you often go to Italy, even as a tourist, as a stranger, you meet someone and within an hour, they might invite you to their house, okay? The personal relationships is stronger than anything else. And it's kind of a tribal connection, right? So. 
This is a kingdom, appears to be a strong kingdom, but it's in fact the result of small clusters, right? Where there are barons controlling small territories, right? They're in charge of those territories. They are the law. They are the state there. And therefore, they resist any order or any attempt to extend the presence of the central government in their own territory. So it looks like a state, but it's just a conglomerate of small feudal territories. And that makes it weaker. What's important about this, they still work commercially, right? They have huge ports such as Naples, but also other ports in Calabria, Sicily, in Apulia, who are very active in trafficking. So they send ships to Africa and the Middle East. Those ships bring back goods, and that's one of the engines of the southern economy. They also have, though, a strong agricultural economy. For example, Apulia is responsible for the largest uh, herds of, of sheep. So they move sheep, depending on the season, from Apulia to Abruzzo, right? So that when the weather is too cold in Abruzzo, you move the sheep down in Apulia, where even winters are warmer. And then you sell the wool, because of course Italy, even at that time, was manufacturing a lot of clothes to sell in the internal market and outside in Europe. So this is definitely a big resource. If you control this part of Italy, you control the production of wool in Italy, the, the, the biggest chunk. Also in this area here, Basilicata, and in Sicily, a lot of wheat is being produced, enough to drive exports of cereals to other parts of Italy, okay? So agriculture is very strong here, possibly as strong or even stronger than the commercial economy. Big state, but very fragmented internally. Let's move up. You have the state of the church. The Pope is the leader of a state that goes around Tuscany and into northern Italy. So you have Lazio, you have central Italy, you have Umbria, you have parts of the Adriatic Sea and into parts of the Po Valley. However, this is less of a state than any other state in Italy. Uh, it is not really a state by any definition, meaning Yes, you see borders in a map, but never believe borders to be real in any historic map in general, and they're not real at all in the case of the church. Meaning, the church doesn't have direct authority over this territory. It has some authority over it. That is to say, there are places where the head of the town, the head of the district, will be a bishop appointed by the Pope. And other places where you have a family of signori, a kind of signoria, who have established their control and the leadership goes from father to son, from son to grandson, etc. And they are formally under the authority of the church. Again, they send Rome money or other goods. It doesn't have to be money. It, it could be cheese or wool or animals instead of money, and soldiers. Some of their younger, stronger uh, uh, men will, will be uh, uh, given, will be loaned to the pope whenever the pope has to put up an army to defend himself or to expand his state. Especially to the north. The northern part is, is very loose. This, this border changes constantly. There is no border. There are no border lines, and there are a lot of small city-states that have survived in here, and they're partially independent, or they're more firmly controlled by the church, depending on the period. Yes, Christina? 
that, that tendency kind of sticks around until like the 19th century, doesn't it? And I think it's in 1929 Very that the so. Vatican has the Lateran Treaty, which kind of... Uh, well, no, uh, first of all, they, they lose most of their territory in 1861. Right. Okay? And then, between 1861 and 1870, basically they control Lazio, the, the area around Rome within two hours, two hours drive. 1870, they lose Rome. That's it. The, and, and you have the creation of Vatican City. Vatican City is the small place where the Pope uh, considers himself almost a prisoner. Okay? Uh, so, and, and then, uh, there is hostility between the Church and the new Italian state for the next at least 50 years until the 1910s, where the Church is also saying to the Catholics, stay away from this state because this is a diabolical entity. On the other side, you see a lot of Jews, Italian Jews involved in the new state. And later, Catholics enter into politics uh, a bit slowly. And then finally, by the 1940s, 1948 on, the Christian Democrats will be the first Italian party until 1994. OK, so it's a very slow process of, of merging of cultures. So Rome controls a series of smaller states that are under the higher authority of the Pope, but they are largely independent in their affairs. And again, Rome is not a strong state because it doesn't receive a lot of resources from the various locales. And keep in mind, this is a very dynamic, a very fluid kind of situation to the north. And this is what Machiavelli will talk about in chapter seven with reference to Cesare Borgia, son of the Pope Alexander VI, trying to solidify their control in here. But whose control? The control of the church, the control of his father, his own control. Is Cesare Borgia going to become a leader in here? Okay, no okay. matter, doesn't matter. Let's, so we've, we've done Rome. Of course, Rome is weaker in terms of resources. It, does, it doesn't have a big army, big deterrence, but has a lot of influence, right? Because they can always invoke other Christian states to their support. If someone tries to attack the Pope, they can always say, oh, yeah, uh, Christians, Catholics, men of good faith, come to the rescue, and the French or the Spanish um, We'll, we'll do that. So it's difficult to unify Italy because you have Rome with a strong diplomatic network. You come to Tuscany, where you see in here, you see Florence, Pisa, Siena. Again, a lot of city-states with a very strong economy, a very strong mercantile economy. As I said before, Florence is like Switzerland during that period, big reserves of cash, gold, etc., amassed through traffic uh, mostly. So southern Tuscany has become a signoria, a larger kind of city state under Siena. Pisa is fighting to remain independent, and Pisa is controlling Sardinia, and Pisa is thriving. Uh, on a mercantile economy because they're not on the sea, but they have the Arno River, and ships from that period can navigate from the shores to Pisa, okay? So goods can be delivered, goods coming from the Middle East can be delivered to Pisa itself. Florence, of course, is the richest of these three states, and eventually Florence will conquer Pisa first, Siena later, but Florence itself will fall under the influence of France because they're not strong enough to play the big game. The big game being who's going to be unifying Italy. Genoa itself used to be at the beginning of the Middle Ages one of the strongest city-states based on commerce. They also controlled Corsica. But during this time, they're fighting for independence. They'll fall under the influence of Milan, they'll fall later under the influence of Turin, and then they'll lose their independence. To this day, you find a lot of private banks 
in Genoa, which are what survives of that kind of mercantile economy that put together large resort reserves of money because the merchants would do two things during this period. One was to import and export goods, and the other thing they did was to use the money they made for merchant ventures, to give loans to other merchants in exchange for money, or give loans to other states. In the 14th century, Florence, just two families in Florence, gave a loan of one million gold florins to uh, the, the state of England, to the king of England, right? So you would have to, to make a calculation of how many tons of gold a million florins would be. Probably be, oh, I give up. <laughs> I have the numbers in my head, but I cannot run them. Okay, north of Genoa, you find Piedmont controlled by Turin. The economy is not very strong there, very little commerce, a little bit of agriculture, but not as strong as the agriculture in the south. So they're not really a player during this time. Moving west, you find the Duchy of Milan. Now, Milan occupies a strategic central position in the Po northern valley of Italy. You have the Po River in here, which is navigable. Ships can go from Turin to the Adriatic Sea. However, Milan will have a complicated series of signori, uh, constant changes in the government, in the leadership, that will weaken their chances at being one of the key players in Italy. And depending on the time, they will fall under France or under Spain eventually. They will remain under Spain. Venice is really the most important player during this time. Venice controls the territory inland, right, the Veneto, going to Verona, Padova, part of Lombardy. At some point, they control areas that are just an hour from Milan, an hour's drive. But they control the entire Gulf here and the shores of Yugoslavia. Up until the 1940s, there were places on the shores of the former Yugoslavia and islands on the shores where people spoke a Venetian dialect. I remember in the 1990s, one of my students, her family came from one of those islands, a very small island, and her grandmother spoke a Venetian dialect. Okay? Um, not only Venice controls traffic through the Adriatic, to the point where a lot of goods cannot be shipped to ports before Venice, south of Venice, because the Venice fleet forces them to ship everything to Venice itself so that they can control the exports, get the fees, the tariffs for importation, okay? And keep in mind that Venice is the most difficult port to land through the entire Adriatic Sea, right? Because you have the lagoon, you have a lot of shifting sands in, in the lagoon to the point where ships are forced to go to Pola, here, there they will find a Venetian pilot who will go on board, and the Venetian pilot will navigate the shifty sands of the Venetian lagoon to uh, uh, reach Piazza San Marco and the vicinity and land there, because where you see, where you go as a tourist, that was an active port. Venice controls also, depending on the period, parts of Crete, parts of Cyprus. So even the Mediterranean, it's kind of a colonial empire. So they have the resources. They are an aristocratic republic. They have the resources to really become, initiate a campaign to conquer the Italian states and become the leaders of Italy and create a national state. They don't want to. They don't want to because they're, they, they don't see Italy as something as enticing, something as attractive economically and politically as their strategy of expansion in the Eastern Mediterranean. That's where their commercial interests are. They have no interest in replacing the King of Naples. 
that would take too many resources. And so what they will do is enter into various alliances trying to stop France, for example, and France will not, Venice will remain independent. France will not able to do anything to Venice. They would conquer Milan. They will control through influence Tuscany. They will conquer for a period Naples, and in Naples they will get the famous French disease, mal francese, syphilis. Their army will stop in Naples, and syphilis will spread through their army quite rapidly. In fact, the Italians called it mal francese. The French from the time will call it the Neapolitan disease because they call it Naples. And you know that most theories support the idea that syphilis became an epidemic during that time, the 1490s, but had come, in fact, from Central America. The other theory is that it was latent in Europe and then became epidemic, uh, changed, a variant changed of, of syphilis became more contagious, okay? So Venice, the richest, the strongest, and potentially a state that could conquer the others, but they have no interest in doing so. And of course, by the end of the 16th century, they would lose a big chunk of their economy because the products they used to bring from Egypt, Palestine, Lebanon into Italy and Europe will travel from India via ship, from Indonesia, Indonesia via ship into Northern Europe. The Portuguese, the Dutch will bring those goods, the Spaniards will bring those goods. So the merchants in, from Venice will go to Jerusalem, will go to Alexandria and find less and less things to buy, okay? So there'll be decadence for them soon enough. I put Ferrara here, but Ferrara is just one in a series of larger city-states or signorias that are smaller than Western Sample, but very rich very powerful economically. Ferrara, even though it's here, controls the Po River that gets into the Adriatic Sea. And again, you can bring ships from through the Po River up to Ferrara, so they get some commerce, and they compete with Venice for this kind of commerce. So what's the general idea that you get out of this as a conclusion? A lot of political fragmentation. A lot of divided interests. So France, Spain, England were able to unify because there you find one region, one area that takes the leadership. And then they have many more resources than the neighboring regions, and therefore they expand. In Italy, you have a lot of central areas, a lot of areas with plenty of resources with diplomatic and commercial interests that are in competition, in contrast with one another. In the smack in the middle, you have the Pope. You cannot touch the Pope. How can you shoot an arrow at the Pope or at a bishop that is leading an army, right? You will go to hell for sure. At the same time, Italy is full of cash, full of gold, full of art full of relics, the parts of the bodies of the saints which have commercial and cultural value. So why not, France thinks, why not invade this area? And France is going through, the King of France, King Charles, is going through Italy to reach southern Italy because it is from here that you control the Mediterranean, right? And you cannot really challenge Venice up here, but you can close this straits and then block Venetian, Venetian commerce. From here you can mount an expedition to the Middle East, etc. And the rest are too small and they can get into alliances, right? They get together in various kinds of alliances, but those alliances change constantly. So Florence can be with Rome at some point, with France at another point. And the other problem that Machiavelli would mention a lot is that the Italian states are not allied to one another. Sometimes they enter into alliances with a foreign state 
France, Spain, the Empire, to advance their interests against other Italian states. All together, all throughout Italy, who are the elites? The elites are not, with the exception of southern Italy, the aristocrats anymore, the barons. The merchants, the rich merchants, the patricians are the elites. So who's in charge of the government? Who's influencing the decisions of the government? Who's deciding foreign politics, the laws governing commerce? The same people who are doing commerce, the merchants. So there is also this constant conflict of interest which creates the condition of animosity, constant hostility and competition that you find throughout the prince. It's built into the system because I'm in charge and I have commercial economic interest. So for example, I'm a Florentine merchant. I'm doing business with France. I don't want to enter into an alliance with Venice. Venice means nothing to me economically. I want the king of France to be my friend because I want to continue making money by selling the French people the goods I manufacture. So this is what I want you to retain from this. Not the, the various details, but the situation and the background to Machiavelli's examples and laws.